Hi, my name is Jonathan, and I am so happy you're here. I'm a patient living with an ultra rare disease. I am only one of 20 other people in the world with my condition. This podcast aims to amplify the voices of those living with rare disease, chronic illness, disabilities, and many other diseases in our world, and to tell their stories and the stories of those who love them. So sit back and take a listen. Hello and welcome to the One of 20 podcast. I'm so happy you're here. Today I'm with Lauren and her son Finn had Mike Cap syndrome. Welcome, Lauren. Hi, so glad to be here. Thank you so much for being here. And I want you to introduce yourself and your story with rare disease. So again, I'm really glad to be here and be the voice, um, not only for my son and his rarity, but also for the rare disease community. Um, I don't think a lot of, not enough information is out there for people to access who, you know, have to unfortunately go through life for their kids, parents, what have you. So um, my son Finn was born with a very rare disease called Makeup Syndrome. The mix stood for microcephaly, which is small brain, so the head does not form fully, so he has a small head, small brain, and his the brain, normally there's grooves on your brain. Um, his brain was smooth. And the second part, um, the cap stands for capillary malformations, which are little red marks all over his body. So stood for um, capillary, like I said, capillary malformation. So they look like little red birthmarks everywhere. When I got pregnant, we didn't know anything was wrong. This specific syndrome is autosomal recessive, which means that both partners have to be carriers of this gene deletion. Now being so rare, um, Ben's father and I didn't even know that this existed, let alone that we were carriers of the syndrome. So it was just, I mean, the odds are just ridiculous. So while I was pregnant, we, you know, I I did have some, some things going on. So I had a high risk doctor that followed me, but they just couldn't ever really pinpoint anything. So that was kind of tough. And they tested for Down syndrome and that came back negative because he did show several markers for that. And when that came back negative, they said, you know, that doesn't mean it couldn't be um, another genetic disease. But they never really sat us down and said, you know, you really should just be aware of that. You know, just because it's not this genetic disease, there are millions of other (laughs) genetic syndromes and diseases that are out there, and we have no idea what this may be. You know, I went along the rest of my pregnancy being like, okay, well, you know, might be something, but I'm not really too worried. So I think I was given kind of like a false sense of hope. But in the back of my mind, that mom intuition had already kicked in. And I was like, in the back of my head, I'm like, oh, something doesn't feel right. You know, so I feel like I kind of knew a lot of the time that something wasn't right. Absolutely. And when Finn was born, did you know immediately by looking at him, did it take oh, yeah. gen- genetic testing? What did that look like? And what did you feel when you found out the diagnosis? <sighs> So while I was still pregnant with Finn, he kept doing like these 
funny movements and everyone was probably probably you know telling me that oh don't worry they're probably just hiccups they're hiccups and I'm like no he's hiccuped before and I've I've felt that because it feels like a specific movement when they hiccup inside of you um and I'm like that's not it that's not it it's something else that they it's just something else is going on and like nobody was really like uh, kind of paying much attention to it so when he was born he was a month early and as soon as I went into labor I remember putting on my shoes getting ready to go to the hospital in labor and telling Finn's father oh, oh my gosh oh my gosh why am I going into labor so early I'm like I'm telling you I'm telling you something's not right something's not okay something's not okay and as soon as he was born he was born seizing so once I saw him doing like the rif- rhythmic movement of the seizures, I said, ah, that's what I was feeling. So he was seizing in utero. That is so, yeah. Wow. That is, that is just so, I can't imagine how difficult that must have been for you. And what did you feel when all of this came to fruition? When you, your mom's sense came like real, like you knew something was wrong. How, how did you Mm -hmm. feel and how did you navigate your emotions while having a newborn? Oh, I, I, I didn't. (laughs) Um, I was just, it, it, it was awful. It was awful because he also had physical deformities so as soon besides the seizing and everything else and you know they do that test when babies are first born and that came out okay but the nurses and everybody were like chittering about him and like they didn't give him to me right away like I held him for like two seconds right after he was born but even then I knew I'm like this doesn't feel right like something doesn't feel right and so then they took him away and they like didn't give him to me they put brought me to a room like a regular hospital room and they weren't bringing him in it was a really long time and I kept asking for him and they weren't bringing him and they weren't bringing him and I'm like what is going on and so then my doctor came in who you know doesn't work you know isn't at this like she wasn't at the hospital and she was going to be Finn's pediatrician she walks in and I'm like what are you doing here like, what's going on? And then she told me that, that, you know, there's something really wrong with him. We don't know what it is. There's nothing that there wasn't a NICU at the hospital when they still did labor and delivery. And they were fantastic. And they didn't have uh, a NICU. So I had to choose on the spot another hospital for him to go to. And I was like, my head was just spinning with the information I got. And I chose Yukon because they were a little closer to where we lived. So he got transferred to Yukon. He got medevac there. And it, that was like the hardest thing, watching them, putting him in um, like this special isolate and just taking him from me and watching that, not knowing what was going to happen, if I was going to ever see him again. Like I was not okay. <laughs> it was awful. I can't even imagine how awful it may have been because you just, this is supposed to be something like they, they say it's the happiest day of your life. And then you find yeah. out this and it's just probably so absolutely soul crushing. And when you got to UConn, did you, did you have to recover at the hospital or did you, were you yeah. also transferred to UConn? Nope. I couldn't leave the hospital yet. I had to recover a little bit. His father, um, uh, my husband at the time, Tom, who was really great, he went, I was like, I'm fine, I'm fine, just go be with him. Like, I wanted him with with Finn to know, like, what was happening, what they were doing, and I didn't want him to be alone. Tom went to Yukon to be with Finn every day. You know, I had family that came to come and check on me and everything, And then um, when I was able to, I was in the hospital, I think, for like two days. And then when I was able to leave, 
I went to Yukon right away. So I didn't get to like really truly like hold him, hold him for was it three days after he was born. And he had, oh my God, he was just so tiny. So he was at UConn for a while and they had all sorts of specialists doing tests on him and like MRIs and this test and that test and this test. And we, I think we had like five different specialists for him just trying to figure out what was going on. Then a few days into being at UConn, I got really sick from the delivery. Um, I got a really bad infection. So I, I couldn't be there. I had to be uh, uh, at home in bed for like five days, which, you know, wasn't great timing. But then one of the specialists we had was a dermatologist. So now, you know, we we were at yeah. UConn for a while. Nobody could figure out anything. We had a special geneticist and she was like, well, he has... Um, you know, all of these symptoms, but it doesn't truly match to this. So it, it could be this, but it doesn't fully match this. So it, like it wasn't, his symptoms weren't fully matching up into any like syndrome that anybody knew of yet. So they were like totally stumped and like annually brought him, like nobody really knew what to do with him or how to treat him. Meanwhile, he's still having seizures. He had uh, intractable seizures, which means that they couldn't get them under control you know we we got home and started going to the specialist for all his different appointments and we had gone to a couple other ones but we get to the dermatologist appointment and we go in and go and a young doctor walks in and he walks in and right away he's got like this article And like, kind of like puts it on the table. He's like, I think I know what it is. And we were like, yeah, okay, whatever. And he's like, no, no, I I really think I know what it is. And he's like, I, you know, he's like this up and coming doctor and like, you know, stays abreast of all like the newest and greatest things coming out. And he's like, no, I just came across this article, you know, written by this geneticist in Canada who came across this little boy who has the exact same symptoms, has the exact same deformations, like everything. And he looks almost exactly like your son. And we were like, what? Wow. And it, yeah, like our, our, we were just like, holy good God, like, ha, I, come on, there's no way. And so he showed us the article and lo and behold, there this article showed the first little boy and then i think there were another family it was like a brother and sister and they all looked exactly like him that is i can't even imagine just Mm -hmm. i I just i'm at a loss for words because i can't even imagine what that even looked like you have a newborn baby you just you want to go home and now you're trying to like figure out answers and was the dermatologist was that the yeah. only specialist I know you had to see a geneticist um were there any other doctors did it affect any other parts of his body like did you yes. have to see a cardiologist a neurologist what did his care look like we had let's see a der- dermatologist neurologist geneticist uh, GI and nephrologist for his kidneys. So his, uh, the doctor that we saw the most was the neurologist. That is, that is so difficult. And I know I personally see my neurologist every three months. So I know sometimes I suffer from chronic migraines. So I know Mm -hmm. how daunting sometimes going to the neurologist can look like. Mm -hmm. And with all of this, you got the diagnosis. And how many people in the world have his condition? It sounds like there's very little, or at the time, there was very little known about it. At that time, Finn was the 11th in the world. Wow. To have what he has. And did they have any resources for you? Any, like, did the geneticist, like, find anything? Like, maybe there was, like a clinical study, gene therapy, something that kind of could 
even though it couldn't cure it by any means, but anything to kind of give you a glimmer of hope or some support? Well, it just so happened that um, Finn, the first little boy who was diagnosed, his name was Brock, him and Finn became best friends. Mm. Like, literally. (laughs) There was also his little girlfriend in Australia. Her name's Taya. They're so cute. They, like, sent back and forth girlfriend and boyfriend packages to each other. Oh, my God. So, right. (laughs) So there were, like, the first group that became diagnosed, which was, like, our little group. We were the first ones. So, known. So um, the geneticist, anything she had to go off of was us. Mm -hmm. So she didn't have anything beforehand to be like, okay, expect this, expect that. Like we were the ones that she is going to go off of to tell other people. The neurologist didn't know anything. Like he didn't really, like we told him, he's like, I don't know what this means because I've never dealt with this before. And like any other doctor we went to, they're like, we don't know what to do. So it was kind of like, you know, we used her uh, as a resource as much as possible, of course. And I got in touch with the other parents, as I mentioned, and I got to meet the mom in Canada, the first one that was diagnosed. We met several times. They came down to us. We went up to them. Like, we went back and forth. Like, we met and became very, very good friends with that family. Do you think Do you think having a friendship like that, even though that this disease is so terrible and so gut-wrenching, do you think it kind of gave you some sort of safety blanket that you weren't alone and that you had someone to lean on that was going through something so similar because there are 10 other families in the world known who are going through this so how did that friendship help you oh my gosh tremendously oh it was it was my saving grace uh, honestly the mom um her and i became really close really fast um her and then the mom in australia there was a mom in New Mexico and Maryland. You just really lean on each other to, you know, be like, oh, did this happen to you? Did this happen to you? Like, okay, well, what did you do with this? And, oh, this really helped me for that. And did, did you try this? Did this work? Okay, no. You know, it was just, it was really great. And our kids made specific noises that other kids didn't make. Like, after a while, like, they would stop crying and stop making any noises at all. Like, they never talked. They never were able to, like, give hugs or anything like that. Um, But they made these specific noises. And I had never heard another child make this noise before. So when our kids, like, as parents, to hear other kids make that noise was something else we had the kids hear each other do it and they were like definitely reacting off of each other and that was pretty amazing oh absolutely i can't even imagine what that bond looks like because it's just something absolutely so rare and so it's something you don't want to be connected by but at the same time if you're going through it it's probably something Mm -hmm. that you Parish and now do you still keep in contact with them or what mm-hmm. does that relationship look like now yes um we still do still do keep in contact unfortunately it's not the same because of you know the outcomes for some of the families unfortunately having um you know we lost finn brock up in canada he's also passed the family in New Mexico lost their child. The one in Maryland, they lost their child. So it's it's hard because you know that that's going to happen eventually. But even so, other mom, you know, like we still, you know, we're there to, you know, have, lean on each other for those times and everything. And uh, still kept in touch after, so... 
just in a different way. Thank you so much for sharing that. I can't even fathom the the difficulty of sharing that and going through that and experiencing that, especially as a parent. And now that Finn has passed and things look different and you're not constantly having to be on caretaker mode, what does life look like now? Have you have you turned this experience into advocacy? Have you just kept his memory alive? How what has your life looked like now after he has passed? Um, that's a good question. But there is not a second that goes by that he, he is not on my mind. Um I have wanted to do something really special in his memory. And to be honest, I'm still looking for that something special um, to do. Um, I haven't really found it yet. And, you know, nothing's really, like, popped out yet, you know. Something that I did really love doing that I felt... um, was kind of in his honor. Um, I don't live there anymore, but I did live in Richfield, Connecticut. And there is this unbelievably amazing movie theater there called the Prospector Theater. It's a 501c3. Um, And their sole mission is to employ adults with disabilities through running a a movie theater. They show, you know, for fun movies and about 80%, I think it's like 75 or 80% of the employees there self-identify as having um, a disability. Um, It's really great. They try to find like what everybody's little bit of sparkle is there and incorporate that into their jobs. So it's a really, really special place. Um, It's it's an absolutely beautiful um, building and theater too. It's, you're not going to find anything like it. But I worked there for a while and I got to work with these amazing adults and all the prospects are amazing. So if anyone is in the area there, I would definitely recommend checking that out. It's an experience you won't forget and you won't find it anywhere else. So working there was a really, I kind of felt like connected with him a little bit there and I miss it very much. Like I said, I'm still really seeking something that I can find that's like a permanent thing that I can do to do something really special, to, like just for him, you know. Thank you so much for sharing his memory and what you went through with him. Because, again, I can't fathom the prospect of losing a child, especially a child so young. And I want to thank you for your bravery and your courage and your willingness to share. And buttoning this all up, what advice do you have for caretakers, whether they are about to be caretakers to a newborn with a rare disease or someone who's 10 years into this? What did Finn teach you and what did you learn from all of this? God, he taught so much to so many people he was just like such a light don't stop loving them no matter what all all kids deserve love and all they want is love whether they can verbally tell you that or not just say all children deserve love so love them as much as you can get help um don't be too proud to ask for help um it took me a a while to realize that and to not be too stubborn to do that but when i finally did it was like oh it took me so long to ask for help so don't be too proud to do that so love the kids as much as you can ask for help when you need it um you'll get through it no matter what Those are beautiful words. I appreciate you so much for coming on and sharing Finn's story. And I know we had 
touched on this earlier. What resources did you find during this journey? I know we have NORD, the National Organization of Rare Diseases in our backyard right here in Danbury, but did you find anything else unique to you that you think others could benefit from? I actually called NORD and because no one had ever heard of his syndrome, you know, like I called them to talk to them about it. And I think they were going to try to find some information. I never heard back from them. And other than that, it, w- it was really tough because no I, nobody knew of it. And there wasn't anything published yet. Now there's something published. So maybe I will. It's a good idea. Thank you for that. Okay. <laughs> um, maybe, maybe I will call it Nord now because the geneticists in Canada just published um, a paper on all the kids. So maybe I will look into that and uh, bring some awareness out to that. Definitely. It's so wonderful that we have Nord as a resource and that mm. the the growing community of rare disease is and the growing community of medicine is finding more and more diseases and hopefully one day we'll find cures for so many rare diseases hopefully in one of our lifetimes i hope but lauren thank you so much for coming on i appreciate your openness your bravery and just sharing your story and fun thank story you. Speaking of resources, um, because there weren't any r- real resources for us, um, the moms and I, we made our own Facebook page. Okay. So a lot of, there have been a couple families yeah. since since us that have had uh, kids diagnosed. There have been a few more kids. And they said that the only information they found was because we made the Facebook page, they found our Facebook page and they found um, a few news articles had been done about Finn and he had been on the news. So when they Googled, they found, um, you know, they found that if there's parents out there who are looking for information and you can't try searching for things like that, um, if you ever, you know, want to talk to somebody who's been through something or maybe walking down, you know, a road that I may have, um, I'm more than welcome. Um, I'm more than happy to speak to um, anybody uh, who's going through a tough time um, in relation to all this. That is wonderful. And thank you again. I can't emphasize my gratitude for your time today. Thank you so much for tuning in to the One of 20 podcast. I am so happy you listened. To find more content from the podcast, you can follow us on Instagram at One of 20 Podcast. And to find more information on rare diseases, you can go to the National Organization of Rare Diseases, Nord.org, and follow them on Instagram and all other social media channels. Thank you so much for tuning in. Be healthy, be safe, and do something good today.